section one of san francisco before and after the earthquake this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by david wales san francisco before and after the earthquake by will irwin section one the city that was a requiem of old san francisco part one this is a recast of a newspaper article of the same title published in the sun april twenty one nineteen o six three days after the visitation came upon san francisco it is here published by special permission of the sun for the title i am indebted to franklin matthews will irwin i'd rather be a busted lamp-post on battery street san francisco than the waldorf astoria willie Britt the old san francisco is dead the gayest lightest-hearted most pleasure-loving city of the western continent and in many ways the most interesting and romantic is a horde of refugees living among ruins it may rebuild it probably will but those who have known that peculiar city by the golden gate have caught its flavor of the arabian nights feel that it can never be the same it is as though a pretty frivolous woman had passed through a great tragedy she survives but she is sobered and different if it rises out of the ashes it must be a modern city much like other cities and without its old atmosphere san francisco lay on a series of hills and the lowlands between these hills are really the end of the coast range of mountains which stretch southward between the interior valleys and the pacific ocean behind it is the ocean but the greater part of the town fronts on two sides on san francisco bay a body of water always tinged with gold from the great washings of the mountain usually overhung with a haze of magnificent color changes across the bay to the north lies mount tamalpais about three thousand feet high and so close that ferries from the waterfront take one in less than half an hour to the little towns of sausalito and belvedere at its foot tamalpais is a wooded mountain with ample slopes and from it on the north stretch away ridges of forest land the outposts of the great northern woods of sequoia sempervirens this mountain and the mountainous country to the south bring the real forest closer to san francisco than to any other american city within the last few years men have killed deer on the slopes of tamalpais and looked down to see the cable cars crawling up the hills of san francisco to the south in the suburbs coyotes still stole in and robbed hen roosts by night the people lived much out of doors there is no time of the year except a short part of the rainy season when the weather keeps one from the fields the slopes of tamalpais are crowded with little villas dotted through the woods and these minor estates run far up into the redwood country the deep coves of belvedere sheltered by the wind from tamalpais held a colony of arks or houseboats where people lived in the rather disagreeable summer months coming over to business every day by ferry everything there invites out of doors the climate of california is peculiar it is hard to give an impression of it in the region about san francisco all the forces of nature work on their own laws there is no thunder and lightning there is no snow except a flurry once in five or six years there are perhaps half a dozen nights in the winter when the thermometer drops low enough so that in the morning there is a little film of ice on exposed water neither is there any hot weather yet most easterners remaining in san francisco for a few days remember that they were always chilly for the gate is a big funnel drawing in the winds and the mists which cool off the great hot interior valleys of the san joaquin and sacramento so the west wind blows steadily ten months of the year and almost all the mornings are foggy this keeps the temperature steady at about fifty five degrees a little cool for the comfort of an unacclimated person especially indoors californians used to it hardly ever think of making fires in their houses except in a few days of the winter season and then they rely mainly upon fireplaces this is like the custom of the venetians and the florentines 
give an easterner six months of it however and he too learns to exist without chill in a steady temperature of little lower than that to which he was accustomed at home after that one goes about with perfect indifference to the temperature summer and winter san francisco women wear light tailor-made clothes and men wear the same fall weight suits all the year around there is no such thing as a change of clothing for the seasons and after becoming acclimated these people find it hard to bear the changes from hot to cold in the normal regions of the earth perhaps once in two or three years there comes a day when there is no fog no wind and a high temperature in the coast district then follows hot weather perhaps up in the eighties and californians grumble swelter and rustle for summer clothes these rare hot days are the only times when one sees women in light dresses on the streets of san francisco along in early may the rains cease at that time everything is green and bright and the great golden poppies as large as the saucer of an after-dinner coffee cup are blossoming everywhere tamalpais is green to its top everything is washed and bright by late may a yellow tinge is creeping over the hills this is followed by a golden june and a brown july and august the hills are burned and dry the fog comes in heavily too and normally this is the most disagreeable season of the year september brings a day or two of gentle rain and then a change as sweet and mysterious as the breaking of spring in the east passes over the hills the green grows through the brown and the flowers begin to come out as a matter of fact the unpleasantness of summer is modified by the certainty that one can go anywhere without fear of rain and in all the coast mountains especially the seaward slopes the dews and the shelter of the giant underbrush hold the water so that these areas are green and pleasant all summer in a normal year the rains begin to fall heavily in november there will be three or four days of steady downpour and then a clear and green week december is also likely to be rainy and in this month people enjoy the sensation of gathering for christmas the mistletoe which grows profusely on the live oaks while the poppies are beginning to blossom at their feet by the end of january the gentle rains come lighter in the long spaces between these winter storms there is a temperature and a feeling in the air much like that of indian summer in the east january is the month when the roses are at their brightest so much for the strange climate which invites out of doors and which has played its part in making the character of the people the externals of the city are or were for they are no more just as curious one usually entered san francisco by way of the bay across its yellow flood covered with the fleets from the strange seas of the pacific san francisco presented itself in a hill panorama probably no other city of the world excepting perhaps naples could be so viewed at first sight it rose above the passenger as he reached dockage in a succession of hill terraces at one side was telegraph hill the end of the peninsula a height so abrupt that it had a one hundred and fifty foot sheer cliff on its seaward frontage further along lay knob hill crowned with the mark hopkins mansion which had the effect of a citadel and in later years by the great white fairmont further along was russian hill the highest point below was the business district whose low site caused all the trouble except for the modern buildings the fruit of the last ten years the town presented at first sight a disreputable appearance most of the buildings were low and of wood in the middle period of the seventies when a great part of san francisco was building the newly rich perpetrated some atrocious architecture in that time too every one put bow windows on his house to catch all of the morning sunlight that was coming through the fog and those little houses with bow windows and fancy work all down their fronts were characteristic of the middle-class residence districts then the italians who tumbled over telegraph hill had built as they listed and with little regard for streets and their houses hung crazily on a side hill which was little less than a precipice 
the chinese although they occupied an abandoned business district had remade their dwellings chinese fashion and the mexicans and spaniards had added to their houses those little balconies without which life is not life to a spaniard yet the most characteristic thing after all was the colouring the sea fog had a trick of painting every exposed object a sea grey which had a tinge of dull green in it this under the leaden sky of a san francisco morning had a depressing effect on first sight and afterward became a delight to the eye for the colour was soft gentle and infinitely attractive in mass the hills are steep beyond conception where vallejo street ran up russian hill it progressed for four blocks by regular steps like a flight of stairs it is unnecessary to say that no teams ever came up this street or any other like it and grass grew long among the paving stones until the italians who lived thereabouts took advantage of this herbage to pasture a cow or two at the end of four blocks the pavers had given it up and the last stage to the summit was a winding path on the very top a colony of artists lived in little villas of houses whose windows got the whole panorama of the bay luckily for these people a cable car scaled the hill on the other side so that it was not much of a climb to home with these hills with the strangeness of the architecture and with the green-gray tinge over everything the city fell always into vistas and pictures a setting for the romance which hung over everything which has always hung over life in san francisco since the padres came and gathered the indians about mission dolores and it was a city of romance and a gateway to adventure it opened out on the mysterious pacific the untamed ocean and through the golden gate entered china japan the south sea islands lower california the west coast of central america australia there was a sprinkling too of alaska and siberia from his windows on russian hill one saw always something strange and suggestive creeping through the mists of the bay it would be a south sea island brig bringing in copra to take out cottons and idols a chinese junk after sharks livers an old whaler which seemed to drip oil home from a year of cruising in the arctic even the tramp windjammers were deep-chested craft capable of rounding the horn or of circumnavigating the globe and they came in streaked and picturesque from their long voyaging in the orange-coloured dawn which always comes through the mists of that bay the fishing fleet would crawl in under triangular lateen sails for the fishermen of san francisco bay are all neapolitans who have brought their customs and sail with lateen rigs stained an orange-brown and shaped when the wind fills them like the ear of a horse along the waterfront the people of these craft met the smelting pot of the races stevenson called it and this was always the city of his soul there were black gilbert islanders almost indistinguishable from negroes lighter kanakas from hawaii or samoa lascars in turbans thick-set russian sailors wild chinese with unbraided hair italian fishermen in tam o shanters loud shirts and blue sashes greeks alaska indians little bay spanish americans together with men of all the european races these came in and out from among the queer craft to lose themselves in the disreputable tumble-down but always mysterious shanties and small saloons in the back rooms of these saloons south sea island traders and captains fresh from the lands of romance whaling masters people who were trying to get up treasure expeditions filibusters alaskan miners used to meet and trade adventures there was another element a less picturesque and equally characteristic along the waterfront san francisco was the back eddy of european civilization one end of the world the drifters came there and stopped lingered a while to live by their wits in a country where living after a fashion has always been marvelously cheap these people haunted the waterfront and the barbary coast by night and lay by day on the grass in portsmouth square the square the old plaza about which the city was built spanish fashion had seen many things 
there in the first burst of the early days the vigilance committee used to hold its hangings there in the time of the sandlot troubles dennis kearney who nearly pulled the town down about his ears used to make his orations which set the unruly to rioting in later years chinatown lay on one side of it and the latin quarter and the barbary coast on the other on this square the drifters lay all day long and told strange yarns stevenson lounged there with them in his time and learned the things which he wove into the wrecker and his south sea stories and now in the centre of the square there stands the beautiful stevenson monument in later years the authorities put up a municipal building on one side of this square and prevented the loungers for decency's sake from lying on the grass since then some of the peculiar character of the old plaza has gone the barbary coast was a loud bit of hell no one knows who coined the name the place was simply three blocks of solid dance halls there for the delight of the sailors of the world on a fine busy night every door blared loud dance music from orchestras steam pianos and gramophones and the cumulative effect of the sound which reached the street was chaos and pandemonium almost anything might be happening behind the swinging doors for a fine and picturesque bundle of names characteristic of the place a police story of three or four years ago is typical hell broke out in the eye wink dance hall the trouble was started by a sailor known as kanaka pete who lived in the what cheer house over a woman known as iodiform kate kanaka pete chased the man he had marked to the little silver dollar where he halted and punctured him the by-product of his gun made some holes in the front of the eye wink which were proudly kept as souvenirs and were probably there until it went out in the fire this was low life the lowest of the low until the last decade almost anything except the commonplace and the expected might happen to a man on the waterfront the cheerful industry of shanghaiing was reduced to a science a citizen taking a drink in one of the saloons which hung out over the water might be dropped through the floor into a boat or he might drink with a stranger and wake up in the forecastle of a whaler bound for the arctic such an incident is the basis of frank norris's novel moran of the lady Letty, and although the novel draws it pretty strong it is not exaggerated ten years ago the police the sailors union and the foreign consuls working together stopped all this kearney street a wilder and stranger bowery was the main thoroughfare of these people an exiled californian mourning over the city of his heart has said in a half hour of kearney street i could raise a dozen men for any wild adventure from pulling down a statue to searching for the cocos island treasure this is hardly an exaggeration it was the rialto of the desperate street of the adventurers these are a few of the elements which made the city strange and gave it the glamour of romance which has so strongly attracted such men as stevenson frank norris and kipling this life of the floating population lay apart from the regular life of the city which was distinctive in itself end of section one section two of san francisco before and after the earthquake by will irwin this librivox recording is in the public domain section two the city that was a requiem of old san francisco part two the californian is the second generation of a picked and mixed ancestry the merry the adventurous often the desperate always the brave deserted the south and new england in eighteen forty nine to rush around the horn or to try the perils of the plains they found there a land already grown old in the hands of the spaniards younger sons of hidalgo and many of them of the best blood of spain to a great extent the pioneers intermarried with spanish women in fact except for a proud little colony here and there the old aristocratic spanish blood is sunk in that of the conquering race then there was an influx of intellectual french people largely overlooked in the histories of the early days and this latin leaven has had its influence 
brought up in a bountiful country where no one really has to work very hard to live nurtured on adventure zion of a free and merry stock the real native californian is a distinctive type as far from the easterner in psychology as the extreme southerner is from the yankee he is easy-going witty hospitable lovable inclined to be unmoral rather than immoral in his personal habits and easy to meet and to know above all there is an art sense all through the populace which sets it off from any other population of the country this sense is almost latin in its strength and the californian owes it to the leaven of latin blood the true californian lingers in the north for southern california has been built up by lungers from the east and middle west and is eastern in character and feeling almost has the californian developed a racial physiology he tends to size to smooth symmetry of limb and trunk to an erect free carriage and the beauty of his women is not a myth the pioneers were all men of good body they had to be to live and leave descendants the bones of the weaklings who started for el dorado in 1849 lie on the plains or in the hill cemeteries of the mining camps heredity began it climate has carried it on all things that grow in california tend to become large plump luscious fruit trees grown from cuttings of eastern stock produce fruit larger and finer if coarser in flavor than that of the parent tree as the fruits grow so the children grow a normal healthy californian woman plays out of doors from babyhood to old age the mixed stock has given her that regularity of features which goes with a blend of bloods the climate has perfected and rounded her figure out of doors exercise from earliest youth has given her a deep bosom the cosmetic myths have made her complexion soft and brilliant at the university of california where the student body is nearly all native the gymnasium measurements show that the girls are a little more than two inches taller than their sisters of vassar and michigan the greatest beauty show on the continent was the saturday afternoon matinee parade in san francisco women in so-called society took no part in this function it belonged to the middle class but the upper classes have no monopoly of beauty anywhere in the world it had grown to be independent of the matinees from two o'clock to half past five a solid procession of dianas hebes and junos passed and repassed along the five blocks between market and powell and sutter and kearney the line of san francisco slang along the open front cigar stores characteristic of the town gilded youth of the cocktail route gathered in knots to watch them there was something latin in the spirit of this ceremony it resembled church parade in buenos aires latin too were the gay costumes of the women who dressed brightly in accord with the city and the climate this gaiety of costume was the first thing which the eastern woman noticed and disapproved give her a year and she too would be caught by the infection of daring dress in this parade of tall deep-bosomed gleaming women one caught the type and longed sometimes for the sight of a more ethereal beauty for the suggestion of soul within which belongs to a new england woman on whom a hard soil has bestowed a grudged beauty for the mobility the fire which belongs to the frenchwoman the second generation of france was in this crowd it is true but climate and exercise had grown above their spiritual charm a cover of brilliant flesh it was the beauty of greece with such people life was always gay if the fairly parisian gaiety did not display itself on the streets except in the matinee parade it was because the winds made open-air cafes disagreeable at all seasons of the year the life careless went on indoors or in the hundreds of pretty estates ranches the californians call them which fringe the city san francisco was famous for its restaurants and cafes probably they were lacking at the top probably the very best for people who do not care how they spend their money was not to be had 
but they gave the best fare on earth for the price at a dollar seventy-five cents a half dollar or even fifteen cents if one should tell exactly what could be had at coppa's for fifty cents or at the fashion for say thirty-five no new yorker who has not been there would believe it the san francisco french dinner and the san francisco free lunch were as the public library to boston or the stockyards to chicago a number of causes contributed to this the country all about produced everything that a cook needs and that in abundance the bay was an almost untapped fishing pond the fruit farms came up to the very edge of town and the surrounding country produced in abundance fine meats game all cereals and all vegetables but the chefs who came from france in the early days and stayed because they liked this land of plenty were the head and front of it they passed on their art to other frenchmen or to the clever chinese most of the french chefs at the biggest restaurants were born in canton china later the italians learning of this country where good food is appreciated came and brought their own style householders always dined out one or two nights of the week and boarding-houses were scarce for the unattached preferred the restaurants the eating was usually better than the surroundings meals that were marvels were served in tumble-down little hotels most famous of all the restaurants was the poodle dog there have been no less than four establishments of this name beginning with a frame shanty where in the early days a prince of french cooks used to exchange ragouts for gold dust each succeeding restaurant of the name has moved further downtown and the recent poodle dog stands uh, stands or stood one mixes his tenses queerly in writing of this city which is and yet is no more on the edge of the tenderloin in a modern five-story building and it typified a certain spirit that there was in san francisco for on the ground floor was a public restaurant where there was served the best dollar dinner on earth at least if not the best it ranked with the best and the others were in san francisco there especially on sunday night almost every one went to vary the monotony of home cooking every one who was any one in the town could be seen there off and on it was perfectly respectable a man might take his wife and daughter to the poodle dog on the second floor there were private dining rooms and to dine there with one or more of the opposite sex was risque but not especially terrible but the third floor and the fourth floor and the fifth the elevator man of the poodle dog who had held the job for many years and who never spoke unless spoken to wore diamonds and was a heavy investor in real estate there were others as famous in their way the zinkand where at one time every one went after the theatre and tate's which has lately bitten into that trade the palace grill much like the grills of eastern hotels except for the price delmonico's which ran the poodle dog neck and neck to its own line and many others humbler but great at the price listen o oh ye starved amid plenty to the tale of the hotel de france this restaurant stood on california street just east of old st mary's church one could throw a biscuit from its back windows into chinatown it occupied a big ramshackle house which had been a mansion of the gold days louis the proprietor was a frenchman of the bas pyrenees and his accent was as thick as his peasant soups the patrons were frenchmen of the poorer class or young and poor clerks and journalists who had discovered the delights of his hostelry the place exuded a genial gaiety of which louis throwing out familiar jokes to right and left as he mixed salads and carried dishes was the head and front first on the bill of fare was the soup mentioned before thick and clean and good next one of louis's three cherubic little sons brought on a course of fish sole rock cod flounders or smelt with a good french sauce the third course was meat this came on en bloc the waiter dropped in the centre of each table a big roast or boiled joint together with a mustard pot and two big dishes of vegetables 
each guest manned the carving knife in turn and helped himself to his satisfaction after that lewis with an air of ceremony brought on a big bowl of excellent salad which he had mixed himself for beverage there stood by each plate a perfectly cylindrical pint glass filled with new watered claret the meal closed with fruit in season all that the guests cared to eat i have saved a startling fact to close the paragraph the price was fifteen cents if one wanted black coffee he paid five cents extra and lewis brought on a beer glass full of it why he threw in wine and charged extra for after-dinner coffee was one of lewis's professional secrets adulterated food at that price not a bit of it the olive oil in the salad was pure california product why adulterate when he could get it so cheaply the wine too was above reproach for lewis made it himself every autumn he brought tons and tons of cheap mission grapes set up a wine press in his back yard and had a little festival vintage of his own the fruit was small and inferior but fresh and lewis himself in speaking of his business said that he wished his guests would eat nothing but fruit it came so cheap the city never went to bed there was no closing law so that the saloons kept open nights and sundays at their own sweet will most of the cafes elected to remain open until two o'clock in the morning at least this restaurant life however does not express exactly the careless pleasure-loving character of the people in great part their pleasures were simple inexpensive and out of doors no people were fonder of expeditions into the country of picnics which might be brought off in almost any season of the year and of long tours in the great mountains and forests hospitality was nearly a vice as in the early mining days if they liked the stranger the people took him in at the first meeting the san francisco man had him put up at the club at the second he invited him home to dinner as long as the stranger stayed he was being invited to weekend parties at ranches to little dinners in this or that restaurant and to the houses of his new acquaintances until his engagements grew beyond hope of fulfilment perhaps there was rather too much of this kind of thing at the end of a fortnight a stranger with a pleasant smile and a good story left the place a wreck this tendency ran through all grades of society except perhaps the sporting people who kept the tracks and the fighting game alive these also met the stranger and also took him in centres of man hospitality were the clubs especially the famous bohemian and the family the latter was an offshoot of the bohemian it had been growing fast and vying with the older organization for the honor of entertaining pleasing and distinguished visitors the bohemian club whose real founder is said to have been the late henry george was formed in the seventies by newspaper writers and men working in the arts or interested in them it had grown to a membership of seven hundred and fifty it still kept for its nucleus painters writers musicians and actors amateur and professional they were a gay group of men and hospitality was their avocation yet the thing which set this club off from all others in the world was the midsummer high jinks the club owns a fine tract of redwood forest fifty miles north of san francisco on the russian river there are two varieties of big trees in california the sequoia gigantia and the sequoia sempervirens the great trees of the mariposa grove belong to the gigantia species the sempervirens however reaches the diameter of sixteen feet and some of the greatest trees of this species are in the bohemian club grove it lies in a cleft of the mountains and up one hillside there runs a natural out-of-doors stage of remarkable acoustic properties in august the whole bohemian club or such as could get away from business went up to this grove and camped out for two weeks on the last night they put on the jinx proper a great spectacle in praise of the forest with poetic words music and effects done by the club in late years this has been practically a mask or an opera it cost about ten thousand dollars it took the spare time of scores of men for weeks 
yet these seven hundred and fifty business men professional men artists newspaper workers struggled for the honor of helping out on the jinx and the whole thing was done naturally and with reverence it would not be possible anywhere else in this country the thing which made it possible was the art spirit which is in the californian it runs in the blood who's who in america is long on the arts and on learning and comparatively weak in business and the professions now some one who has taken the trouble has found that more persons mentioned in who's who by the thousand of the population were born in massachusetts than in any other state but that massachusetts is crowded closely by california with the rest nowhere the institutions of learning in massachusetts account for her preeminence the art spirit does it for california the really big men nurtured on california influence are few perhaps but she has sent out an amazing number of good workers in painting in authorship in music and especially in acting high society in san francisco had settled down from the rather wild spirit of the middle period it had come to be there a good deal as it is elsewhere there was much wealth and the hills of the western addition were growing up with fine mansions outside of the city at burlingame there was a fine country club centering a region of country estates which stretched out to menlo park this club had a good polo team which played every year with teams of englishmen from southern california and even with teams from honolulu the foreign quarters are worth an article in themselves chief of these of course chinatown of which every one has heard who ever heard of san francisco a district six blocks long and two blocks wide housed thirty thousand chinese when the quarter was full the dwellings were old business blocks of the early days but the chinese had added to them had rebuilt them had run out their own balconies and entrances and had given the quarter that feeling of huddled irregularity which makes all chinese built dwellings fall naturally into pictures not only this they had burrowed to a depth of a story or two under the ground and through this ran passages in which the chinese transacted their dark and devious affairs as the smuggling of opium the traffic in slave girls and the settlement of their difficulties in the last five years there was less of this underground life than formerly for the board of health had a clean-up some time ago but it was still possible to go from one end of chinatown to the other through secret underground passages the tourist who always included chinatown in his itinerary saw little of the real quarter the guides gave him a show by actors hired for his benefit in reality the place amounted to a great deal in a financial way there were clothing and cigar factories of importance and much of the pacific rice tea and silk importing was done in the hands of the merchants who numbered several millionaires mainly however it was a tenderloin for the house servants of the city for the san francisco chinaman was seldom a laundryman he was too much in demand at fancy prices as a servant the chinese live their own lives in their own way and settle their own quarrels with the revolvers of their high binders there were two theatres in the quarter a number of rich joss houses three newspapers and a chinese telephone exchange there is a race feeling against the chinese among the working people of san francisco and no white man except the very lowest outcast lived in the quarter on the slopes of telegraph hill dwelt the mexicans and spanish in low houses which they had transformed by balconies into a semblance of spain above and streaming over the hill were the italians the tenement quarter of san francisco shone by contrast with those of chicago and new york for while these people lived in old and humble houses they had room to breathe and an eminence for light and air their shanties clung to the side of the hill or hung on the very edge of the precipice overlooking the bay on the verge of which a wall kept their babies from falling the effect was picturesque and this hill was the delight of painters it was all more like italy than anything in the italian quarter of new york and chicago the very climate and surroundings the wine country close at hand the bay for their latine boats helped them 
over by the ocean and surrounded by cemeteries in which there are no more burials there is an eminence which is topped by two peaks and which the spanish of the early days named after the breasts of a woman the unpoetic americans had renamed it twin peaks at its foot was mission dolores the last mission planted by the spanish padres in their march up the coast and from these hills the spanish looked for the first time upon the golden bay many years ago some one set up at the summit of this peak a sixty-foot cross of timber once a high wind blew it down and the women of the fair family then had it restored so firmly that it would resist anything it has risen for fifty years above the gay careless luxuriant and lovable city in full view from every eminence and from every valley it stands to-night above the desolation of ruins the bonny merry city the good grey city oh that one who has mingled the wine of her bounding life with the wine of his youth should live to write the obituary of old san francisco End of section two. Section three of San Francisco Before and After the Earthquake by Will Irwin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section three The City That Is, written for the call by Will Irwin will irwin a san franciscan in exile at the time of the nineteen o six disaster wrote and published in the new york sun under the title the city that was a magnificent tribute to the old town he sprinkled the ashes with his tears the article in book form became widely known in the literature of the catastrophe to-day his tears long since forgotten mr irwin pays a different sort of tribute to the city that he loves i first came into the new san francisco in august nineteen o seven during the era of rebuilding i returned i remember to weep i was in the condition that morning of a man preparing for a sentimental jag i parted at the oakland mole with my train friends of the overland journey i wanted to go to my sorrow alone as i sat by the front rail of the boat watching that indescribable swell of the bay surge down on us i was startled by a laugh beside me i turned with a feeling of indignation it was unseemly mirth at a funeral i had to shake myself to remember that these people had been dwelling in crushed san francisco for a year and that a year is a long time to pack around any grief there they were talking business reading their newspapers flirting with their girls i i alone was living through a new grief i looked at the bare hill below the fairmont at the bump where the hopkins institute used to crown the citadel of the town and got ready to shed not unmanly tears when i should stand in the midst of that ruin and wreckage at the station i waved aside the omnibus and prepared to walk up through the wreck of dear old scenes alone i might have wept there it was the only chance i had as it turned out but for a fellow i knew we fell into each other's arms before i had fairly wrenched away he had pulled the blueprint on me ten stories concrete he said see her up there that skeleton on battery street you remember the old three-story shack bill honest i'm glad she burned down ain't that the greatest sight that ever was and he pointed up market street there it was a city rising market street torn up to its very entrails a forest of steel skeletons as far as the eye carried the donahue fountain in appropriate setting for once fringed with bricks and mortar and girders a chorus of ratchets making music on steel as we stood there watching a newsboy shoved a paper in my face and made jesting remarks as san francisco newsboys will do on the shape of my hat a man in overalls rolled up and addressed me not with the professional whine of the eastern panhandler but with the democracy of the unrivalled pacific coast product you look like a nice young fellow if you do have a funny face he said in effect 
say i'm just in from bellingham beat out of my pay and want two bits for a drink as i came across a sound of music pierced the noise of the ratchets beside the ferry entrance a schützenfest park picnic had stacked up waiting for transportation girls in white dresses and white caps men in white trousers and sashes details of ribboned canes and official badges and baskets and plump mothers and noisy babies there it was just as though the town had not burned down that touch finished me i turned to the fellow i knew he recalled to me yesterday what i said hell oh, i doubt that introductory word but he says i slipped it in my excitement this would be the same old town if they moved it to the top of mount hamilton and my not unmanly tears are unshed to this day never did i notice any difference in the people either then or now they remain the same easy lovable open-minded sulphites that they were when the line ran from the baldwin to bush that they were when dennis carney ran the sand lots that they were doubtless when the two original inhabitants sat on the bay shore at montgomery street and alternately divided their food supply and worked politics on each other over the division of town lots they change their roofs above them but not their hearts but the new city on its physical aspect has been a matter of deep and personal concern to exiled californians we have debated upon it with a horror lest our builders would remake san francisco on the pattern of one of those middle western cities which seem to have been ordered by the size from grand rapids ugly as were the old buildings of the downtown district in detail their massing and their coloring of greenish-gray from accumulated sea moss made them curiously attractive in mass the artist appreciated this consciously and i suppose that the passionate devotion to san francisco in the mass of northern californians was due in part to an unconscious appreciation of this hidden beauty new buildings and porcelain bathtubs and twentieth-century plumbing were all very well we told each other but would the new city run also to castile soap pillars and gilded plaster and pressed glass mirrors it was a great thing to have a fine new business equipment and to be mistress of the pacific but could there be anything of the old physical charm about the modern san francisco the miracle has happened modern architects have built the new city out of modern materials on modern plans and the external charm of the place remains it is just as hard to say why as it ever was to explain the allurement of san francisco for the eye much of the new architecture is good most of it is passable a very little is as bad as that old fancy-work architecture of san francisco which gillette burgess used to satirize as chaos avenue on the whole it is certainly better work than any eastern city would erect were it called upon to rebuild that is a tribute not so much to our architects as to their clients nowhere in the united states is the art sense so general among people of means as in san francisco if our builders here have nearly worked out a new american school in the adaptation of the redwood bungalow style to city uses the people in general deserve half the thanks it is a wonderful new city with all its old distinction saved it becomes now my mission to dry the tears of exiled californians there are only five american cities which stand apart from the rest for appearance boston new york charleston new orleans and san francisco we are preserved forever in that column now for example i had done a lot of worrying about the crest of russian hill as seen from the southeast i heard that buildings were going up fast in that district they'll ruin it i said i came up taylor street last monday in the twilight and found that they had not ruined russian hill they had made it nowhere in the united states is there a vista so satisfying to the eye so suggestive of romance as that summit as seen from taylor and broadway 
i remembered then the old picture of grey rooftops and lanes of yellow light which we used to admire from our windows on russian hill i looked down there was only one change in the picture what had been grey was now white and beyond that eternal among these changes of man was that golden bay with its surge as of a river and its distant lights that and the hills and the mists would make us distinctive i suppose were we to replace our buildings by patterson new jersey or chelsea massachusetts it is a larger city a more convenient city and since it is also a more beautiful and more distinctive city i announce myself a complete convert this uh, city that was business is the old stuff end of section three the city that is end of san francisco before and after the earthquake by will irwin